the track. Hi, this is Alan and Leon. Welcome to Seize the Moment Podcast, episode 12. And before we start, just wanted to let you know that if you want to follow us, you can follow us at Seize the Moment Podcast on Instagram and Facebook, and at Seize underscore podcast on Twitter. And if you want to see more of our videos and notifications when they come up, check us out on YouTube, Seize the Moment Podcast. Click on the subscribe button and the little the bell, bell mm-hmm. yeah, to get notifications. Yep. Today, we wanted to talk about why, why is it for us to change? Why does it take us or a lot of us to get to hit rock bottom mm-hmm. in order for us to um, start to try to take changes in sort of a, not necessarily positive direction, but I would say a different direction. One, you know, deviant to something that, uh, let, let's say like, uh, I guess since we're just starting off here, let's say we're talking about um, drug addicts or alcoholics or something like that. Yeah. Why is it that, like, let's say we, let's say we see a friend, they they drink all the time, like a lot, like a lot, like not, not the normal drinking. That's a normal, it's a socialized thing. Mm-hmm. It's cool. But then there's some of our friends who like will drink to, uh, till blackout, have these bad behaviors. They wake up uh, with hangovers the next day. And it's like, we see it and we maybe sometimes we'll even say to our friend, like, why would you like continue doing this behavior? Don't you see it's bad for you? Mm-hmm. And maybe they might logically uh, say that they do understand that. But then, for some reason, even though there's that logical, like, intellectual understanding, like, I know this is bad, they won't, uh, or even if they try to make some kind of change, it's like, there's not enough, how should I put this, like, enough motivation Hmm? on the, what do you want to call it, like a seesaw, like, there's more, there's more invested in continuing the behavior versus, like, uh, trying to leverage that seesaw into like taking some kind of action to get out of that bad behavior like what what do you think uh, is why do you think people like need to hit that like a really painful place in order to yeah. start changing well i think it's one of two reasons or yeah i mean it's one of two reasons in the sense of it can either be one of two reasons mm-hmm. so usually so what kills motivation is a sense of hopelessness for a lot of people and so if you think about kind of depression and how it works and a lot of the times let's say anxiety depression they're connected to substance abuse or alcohol abuse issues and so when you think about it like that so the idea is with depression there's a lack of energy and a lack of motivation that is connected with this deep-seated sense of hopelessness so for a lot of people what happens to them essentially is that they feel like they can't change so it's like they know on some level that they have to change but there's a part of them that thinks well I'm sort of too far gone and that there's no going back now and that's sort of at one end of the spectrum and at the other end of the spectrum what you tend to see is this idea of well I don't know if this idea but it's a kind of it's a denial right to sort of put simply just simply put so it's a denial that anything is really wrong so somebody tells you like hey I'm seeing these things and you I'm seeing these sort of toxic behaviors and this is how they're affecting other people and what we tend to do is we either minimize that or we just sort of block it out of our minds altogether we rationalize in order to keep our world keep making sense right if if we disrupted that reality it would give too much uncertainty and probably like a loss of um, comfort and it feels better to in that person's reality in that person's version of things to maintain their actions because something deviant to that would mean like a uh, like a I don't want to say like a dist- <laughs> I'm getting weird here a destruction of the self <laughs> you know I don't want to say it like that <laughs> it's like yeah it's like there's this this like a like a structure that almost you're trying to keep alive right. because it's the only one you know. Mm-hmm. And if that one, if it collapsed, your whole sense of the world collapses. Yeah. And then why would you do that unless there was uh, something uh, better to yeah. try to, like, how do I say this? Like, say you knew that there was a better way. Mm-hmm. Maybe then, maybe then you would let your uh, current view of the world collapse. Mm-hmm. But usually I notice that, yeah, unless somebody gets to a point of like such pain and suffering, right. that like there's this huge dopamine loss, like the structure is just forcibly falling. Right. It's not like in the middle of this process where you can already tell someone to 
do something good, but they won't. Mm -hmm. The structure has fallen because they hit that rock bottom. Right. Then it's like, okay, there's nothing else left to do but rebuild. Mm -hmm. At that point, you'll start probably seeking out new actions. Because yeah. why would you want to do the same things you did before at that point? It doesn't make sense. You won't you won't get the same result. Right. Unless the person has a sense of hopelessness. So sometimes what we even see is in treatment that when a person hits rock bottom, they still don't want to get... Like, well, in treatment, I mean for mental health treatment. And when it comes to or pertains to substance abuse, that even when they know that there's an issue, they still don't want to get help because they feel like it's hopeless. That no matter what they do it's actually never going to change so a lot of where this comes from is this sort of deep-seated sense of like no matter what or no matter how hard i try nothing is really going to be different and then when you have the other end of the spectrum right when it's sort of denial and a lot of the time by the way denial and hopelessness is connected so the reason why we deny that there's even a problem is literally to mask the hopelessness that there is a problem right and that i can do something about it and so when it comes to denial right it's a little when it's on its own it's a little bit easier to kind of um, let's say penetrate just for the simple fact that when there isn't a sense of hopelessness the idea is that like I just want to kind of keep having fun and I don't want to acknowledge that my toxic behavior or let's say the way it's affecting other people so when it comes to denial it's a little bit easier where rock bottom once a person hits rock bottom it's like oh okay you know what now like I, I get it like there's really the, the defense is sort of gone there's really not much else I could do the big problem is literally that sense of hopelessness when a person feels like no matter what they do that nothing is going to change and just to kind of shift just a little bit right but I do think this is obviously relevant is that when it comes to even mental health right outside of substance abuse and alcohol abuse a lot of times people think that these symptoms are this sort of deeply ingrained or these deeply ingrained parts of their personality so when they think that let's say here's my anxiety here's my depression right here's sort of the way i react to people if i perceive it even as an overreaction but they see it as okay this is a deep-seated part of who i am so why would i get treatment for that right this is just who i am so when but they kind of do one of two things they either explain the way the behavior is not being so bad or they just kind of deny it altogether or or they even sort of shift blame to the other person and say, well, it's not that I'm like this because I'm like this, but it's literally because these other people are making me like this. But when we sort of are, I guess for lack of a better word, kind of married to our symptoms, when we perceive ourselves or our identities in conjunction with those symptoms, where we think that, let's say they're immalleable and then they're just sort of inherent part of who we are and who we'll always be, virtually people like would think in that point there's no point of getting treatment because like what's there to treat? This is just a part of who I am. And that's like one of the biggest myths of mental illness, that I will always be depressed. And a lot of the times when people come into treatment, when they sort of focus on their negative self-image, sometimes they tell me things, well, a lot of the times and sometimes also, um, they tell me things like, well, I'm just this depressed piece of shit. Like, this is just a part of who I am. And, you know, like, internally, it's easy for me to say that's ridiculous, obviously, but for them, that's really just how they see themselves. Like, I've always been this way, therefore, it has to be a part of my personality, even though technically it isn't. The depression tends to come in episodes, so it's sort of periodic. It's just that when we're in those particular states, it feels like that's the sort of embodiment of who we are fully. Isn't it nuts, though, that we'll take ideas like that and we'll truly believe in them as if they're true? Yeah. It's, it is weird. Like, uh, I mean, it makes sense from that perspective of the person who's like, oh, I'm a depressed piece of shit or something. Mm -hmm. I, I can relate to that. I've had points in my life, for instance, where I, I was like really, really like whoa depressed like whoa mm -hmm. and like uh also this is related as well so i used to be like um i might have mentioned this before on the show maybe not uh this is just for the audience i know you know already uh but i was uh once upon a time like 300 pounds and um it, it's fine it's a it's just physical right but technically speaking because i uh weigh that much i moved around a little bit slower i was a little more lethargic i didn't want to uh move around um the foods i was eating weren't really um of course since i got to that way i was eating like processed foods a lot of soda a lot of stuff that uh, would um, i don't know it's like as if my brain was running on gasoline it wasn't like actual like good nutrients or anything like that mm -hmm. now i was thinking depressed thoughts during that period of time now you could say like it could be because of a lot of different factors whether it, one is diet two is it could just be literally uh, the things I'm exposing myself to every day exactly. or the thoughts I'm thinking. It's exactly all thinking. of those things. And it's all of those things, yeah. But what's fascinating to me is that in order for, uh, because in order for me to actually decide to change at one point, to start going to the uh, gym, to try to start eating differently, which took, by the way, a really long time. There's no magic pill to it. No. Um, a lot of people might frame it that way in marketing or in like the seven minute abs, mm -hmm. you know, or something like that. That's no offense. It's bullshit. Like 
I think if that gets somebody to work out like that kind of marketing, in that sense, only in that sense is that good. Right. But otherwise, it's way takes a lot more work than than that. It's not all. Uh, we think we were talking about it yesterday. It's not like all this raw raw stuff. Right. Which a lot of um, I love self help by the way, mm-hmm. and I understand I'm jumping around. I'll get back to the main point. But like I love self help. Um, I think it's fantastic. You start asking questions about. Uh, like I guess you're asking uh, about your life, looking at yourself very closely, um, which is not something that you traditionally normally would do, right? Mm-hmm. And it's not like our family and our friends usually will give you real feedback on how you're behaving and what you're doing. Sometimes, yeah. yeah. But a lot of times it's like people will give you lip service mm-hmm. or they just won't uh, – or they're more involved in what's going on with them. So you'll never truly know – how it is you're behaving. So like when you have references like that, let's say in self-help or in treatment, Mm -hmm. actually. Wow, how did I not say that first? That's hilarious. Look, I'm talking with (laughs) Leon here, the psychotherapist. I probably should be referencing that first. But but just to, you know, keep going with my point. Um, Yeah, it's a lot of the things that you need to do in order to um, create change, it's it's really kind of gritty. It's like you got to get your... uh, elbows in the dirt so to speak and um, for me personally uh, that process was um, was it was painful but like you know there's people who go through a lot of different things in the world there's people who um, live in uh, really crazy conditions or there's a lot of crime where they grow up with crime around them people dying all the time mm-hmm. stuff like that and I understand like everyone's experience is relative but when I talk about this kind of stuff, I don't. I'm not trying to paint myself as like, oh, it was this. No, I don't think. Yeah. I know. Probably mm-hmm. nobody's gonna think that. No. But you never know. Like it's true. And that's interesting, by the way. That's actually how a lot of people struggling with depression view it. They're like, oh, well, why am I like this? Why am I like Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh? Like, what was me when there's so much other shit going on in the world? That's the thing, though. So depression actually does that to you too, where it kind of feeds you this bullshit that says your problems aren't important. Why are you so selfish and why are you so kind of zeroed in on it, right? Obviously, this all exists on the spectrum, right? Because there are people who struggle with depression, you know, and even still, it can argue, it can obviously be argued that even that obviously isn't. Because what I was gonna say, or like if somebody's sort of complaining about, I don't know, not having the latest car, right? Or let's say not getting into like you know kind of an ivy league university or whatever i mean it's also easy to kind of sort of explain that away and say ah well they're just sort of spoiled and actually no so some of my patients you know they're kind of like that right where they kind of talk about these things that for maybe other people seem to be trivial but when you kind of get down to it you find out that these things are like um let's say these sort of worries or um let's say the sadness that they have over not acquiring or having these things are really indicative of their self-image. So technically speaking, it's not even their fault because in their minds, right, if they're sort of supposed to feel good about themselves, they're supposed to have all of these things. No, it's not their fault. That's true. But it is their responsibility, though, Mm -hmm. to still see that, I should put this, like that you're preserving your view of the world by putting, let's say, for instance, the guy with the car, the car example, right. uh, he's like, oh, uh, I don't have this kind of car. So then he's going to feel uh, upset about that. Right. And that feeling upset allows him to cope with this current reality mm-hmm. and why circumstances are currently the way they are. Right. But this is like, if you truly understood what you're doing there, it's like an illusion. It's like you're just, it's just to preserve your way of looking, but it's not... Mm-hmm. Here. Truth, and I understand that everybody's concerned with truth. Thank you. You know also why it's so hard because think of it like this so even if we come up for let's say we come to these deeper truths in session a person's still going back to their environment so it's like it's very hard for them to say like okay now i know that sort of this is all trivial and right and i'm not i don't want to be so shallow and these aren't things that are very important to me but then like how do you sort of live and adapt to the culture that is like that the thing is well okay so what you just said there i think the answer lies there it's in the culture Mm -hmm. so it depends on who you surround yourself with Mm -hmm. uh if you're currently in an environment and we spoke on this before a little bit in other podcasts but if you're in an environment that's toxic Mm -hmm. or not necessarily toxic but just kind of feeds into a reality that keeps you in place Mm -hmm. and doesn't allow you to um shake your you know just experience something different Mm -hmm. Doesn't necessarily have to be. Uh, I mean, uh, hopefully you're aiming for something better. Mm-hmm. But the idea is, if you want a different um, world, you have to arrange 
Uh, well, I mean, yes, it's an internal thing, but you also have to arrange your outside environment. You do, but the, that, that's also in itself very hard, as I'm sure you know. No, 100%. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But there, it, then, then let me be someone who will say this, at least, from personal experience. It's hard, but it's also... It's like this. there's this incremental change that takes place. Now, it, let's say that, um, especially when it comes to diet, right? And uh, it's not an easy thing to maintain, like, a perfect diet. I mean, once once you do it and you ingrain the habit, it's easy. Mm-hmm. But to start on that journey is not. Um, you'll notice a lot of, you'll move forward a little bit mm-hmm. and then backwards a bit. Mm-hmm. And forward a bit and then really back. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes r- way, like, extremely great. But then another, you know, you go back because it's like uh, you have to be consistent Mm -hmm. and that consistency is what's gonna create like an increment that like little point one percent increase every day for example um, you mean the motivation right motivate you know there's a thing like I think motivation is good um, but I think it's not sustainable Mm -hmm. Um, I think that if someone's coming from like somewhere quote-unquote down low what, what that means is like just from a place where they're trying to take action they're not even at a place where they're taking any action at all mm-hmm. then yes like let's say you're listening like I would do this I would listen to a lot of motivational videos on mm-hmm. YouTube and stuff like that and yeah it would definitely get me in the zone it would help me with taking action when I was at the gym or something like that too I'd listen to this stuff and maybe something that you know I felt like just stopping and just going home I would continue right. so in that sense motivation is will keep you going right but then there's a point where you have to have like certain systems in place, which will keep you consistent. Like, like uh, for example, let's say for me, even though I don't recommend this for everyone, but I try to go to the, let's say to the gym almost every day. Mm-hmm. Why? Because I'm aware of things like, let's say, uh, decision-making fatigue, mm-hmm. which uh, you can find research to support that. Right. Um, okay, so what is decision-making fatigue, right? For instance, there's a certain amount of like um, proactive decisions that you could make in the day. Right. Usually, when it starts out earlier in the day, you have your the highest level of willpower you could possibly have. Right. And then towards the end of the day, it's kind of drained from you. Mm-hmm. If you know stuff like that, then you'd have to kind of set your world up in a way mm-hmm. where you know where you're going to, in order to do things without necessarily having to make a proactive decision. It's like almost automatic for you. Right. So for me, like, I don't have to make a decision necessarily anymore to go to the gym. It's mm-hmm. just become ingrained at this point. Yeah. But let's say somebody is starting doing this. Mm-hmm. Then, yeah, the motivation could come from, like, let, let's say if somebody's watching this, find somebody who inspires you. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, I had many different role models. Um, uh, I've heard, like, in those motivational speeches, like Ali, mm-hmm. for instance. Ali's cool. Who, mm-hmm. uh, well, by the way, struggled with anxiety as well. Which is very little. Money. I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's that. Uh, yeah, it. before yeah. every fight, he was like, nah, he he said he wasn't terrified, but he said he was something along the lines of super nervous, which is literally anxiety. So it's interesting how we sort of tend to build people up as heroes and like these sort of godlike people, but yet they have their own or had their own struggles. But but why do we look at him like as a, like a? Uh, I'll I'll use another word, but still meaning the same thing. Mm-hmm. You mean like an idol? Yeah. Right. All these idols. Yeah, we do. Uh, tend to think that they're perfect they've always been the way they were mm-hmm. but of course like yeah no they they're just as human as you yeah. like even the celebrity like a lot of people freak out when they see celebrities mm-hmm. I get it but here's the thing like at the same time it's literally another person like you who just happened to just take actions in a certain direction that and look this... and they might even be more talented than you which is okay but the point is that that's, but that's that's the thing right. like that's the difference like they'll actually they are just like you but they decided to take these actions Mm -hmm. and it's like that's probably the only thing that's probably separating you from them Mm -hmm. maybe other factors too I'm just I'm maybe blind spot yeah I mean like I wouldn't devalue celebrities completely well not devalue them in the sense no not to devalue them just just to be like yeah you know it's a person just like for example celebrities I've just heard this perspective before Mm -hmm. they hate when somebody asks them uh, or maybe in the beginning they like when somebody's like asking for a picture or a fo- autograph or something right. like that, but they dislike that that after a certain amount of time mm-hmm. they're just like, can you just be like a normal person? Like mm-hmm. why? And also why do you deify me right. or idolize me 
like I'm just like you like you could just come at me normal right and, and yeah and it's so interesting because I think that kind of factors into the fact that social media is as prevalent as it actually is. So, think interestingly enough, right? I mean, I don't obviously know what the sort of ratio is from then to now, but back before Instagram and back before just Twitter or any other form of social media, there were very few, or not very few, but few were celebrities, right? Now, sort of everybody's a celebrity. So, if you think about it, back then we were comparing ourselves to like, you know, and obviously I'm simplifying this kind of for the purpose of argument, that we used to sort of look at this handful of people and say, wow, like I wish I were like them, right? But for the most part, sort of our day-to-day -day was full interacting with let's say or full of interacting with kind of ordinary people like us right so now right when we have sort of access to social media and it's sort of 24 7 right now it's not only that we're comparing ourselves to other people in our circle but now we're also comparing ourselves to like literally every other person on instagram that we look at and now everybody's so famous right insta famous these influencers or whatever literally people famous for just being famous the point is that now we have so many other people to compare ourselves to i actually don't mind that okay I think it's created a whole bunch of problems, mm -hmm. which is what I'm getting from what you're saying. But actually, on the other side of things, um, I feel like it's also good because that means that now you're kind of getting an insight to what these people who are kind of a little more on the cutting edge of life, like how they behave mm -hmm. and how they live. You don't, Not everyone seeks that out. Fair enough. That's a very niche thing. Right. I don't want to uh, pretend like everyone's trying to... You know, everyone's fighting for the world to be a better place. and all, Not everyone has that intention. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I mean, ultimately, like, uh, if you looked at it deeply, like, so a lot of people are trying to just yeah. go for what benefits them, usually. Right. But, but that, that, you could say, is benefiting the world. But depend. we're getting very general here. Okay, yeah. my bad. No, it's but, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but um, by having these influences around, it's actually good. What if you... What if, all the influences that you took in, mm -hmm. as far as social media goes, were the ones from the people who are kind of on the cutting edge of life in terms of like, mm -hmm. okay, uh, for instance, enough emotional intelligence to have like impulse control. Like let's say we found uh, who's somebody good for that. Um, um, okay, let's go away from that one for one second. And actually, you know what, let's stick with it. Uh, the Rock, for example. Mm -hmm. um, He's somebody who has a, 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 like iron will, like just uh, his discipline is amazing. If this is true, I believe he gets up every morning around 4.30 a.m., something mm -hmm. like that, and he works out all the time. Which, by the way, I would never advocate for anybody, just FYI. Fair enough, mm -hmm. but uh, no, of course, you don't have to necessarily yeah. do that. But for instance, if you see that uh, somebody taking those kinds of actions, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like normal for them, and uh, it's just like this discipline. It's like part of their system, and that's how they're wor you know working and uh, increasing their health and just mm -hmm. you know that's that's not a bad example of that. Do you have to go to that extent? No. Right. Can you really be successful as far as your health goes without doing what he's doing exactly? Of course. But why did I bring him up? Because that's like one example of that. For instance, you want somebody who can keep riffing and keep talking. Mm -hmm. But it's just clear, succinct, right. no ums or ahs. It's able to espouse some of the most beautiful things ever, like Jason Silver, for instance. Right. He knows how to just like kind of like the kind of like those rappers who can just kind of free flow and create like a good rap or something like that. He's able to do that, but while grabbing from like just intellectual not like from things that he's learned, right. and it's just fantastic to hear him speak. Mm -hmm. That's another example right. of somebody you can, uh, and there's many more. And it, so in that sense, I think um, if let's say, you know, just to tie it back to um, a person's environment, which we spoke about earlier, if somebody designed their, at least that aspect of their environment, the, let's say the internet, social media part, right. which is a big part of most people's lives, at least, at least in, in cities and let's say the United States, mm -hmm couldn't say that for the rest of the world but let's just say for here so if that's your thing uh yeah you could really architect like might not be the right word but you may be yeah, able to design yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. what <laughs> what influences come in right and yes that won't necessarily change the people that you're seeing every day necessarily mm -hmm. not immediately right. but by sh shifting at least in that direction with uh, let's say the social media influences you can make that little 0.1 percent change every day and that stacks up right. uh, back to even 
earlier on, right, with the, let's say, uh, for me with weight loss. Now, I understood that drinking the uh, juice with the 10 different vegetables in there, mm-hmm. drinking it once would just offer me, what, what would just ha- what benefit do you think that, that gives you? If, uh, if I drink a healthy juice right now, in the long scheme of things, how much do you think that'll really affect my health? Just that one time of drinking. <laughs> okay, so not consistent. Uh, not consistent, just the one time. It wouldn't do nothing, minimal. And uh, yeah, let's, let's the say. The minimal of the minimal. It'll do the minimal yeah. of the minimal. Uh-huh. But what do you think stacking that, let's say every day or almost every day, right. that let's say 0.1%, right. that's just then that's just another 0.1, 0.1, 0.1, 0.1. Yeah. Eventually you get to one, let's say. Right. That's one little change. Right. Then let's say with working out, you, uh, yeah, that one time of doing it is good. It's great that somebody, if you take an action that you never took before, mm-hmm. even if it's like your first time doing it, and then let's say you even went back to your old habits for a second, mm-hmm. the fact that you are able to do something different, uh, even though everything is telling you to do the same thing over and over again, mm-hmm. um, that's really like, it says a lot about the person. Mm-hmm. Like actually, any, let's say somebody's listening to this and then they try to do something different and it's not very successful even in the beginning mm-hmm. you still get like for me like tremendous respect mm-hmm. because at least you're trying yeah. and then and that's part of the process you, you, you again like I said before you go a little bit forward sometimes you, you get a little setback right. forward again and then eventually you could kind of start going in a direction with that mm-hmm. that's one example um, well, but so yeah. I would say that the downside of all of this or the dark side of social media and sort of personal development and self-help is literally an addiction to it. So not only just an addiction to it, but here's all, the other thing. So as human beings, we tend to negatively compare ourselves to other people. So you're seeing it, and I definitely agree with you that it can and should be used this way as this sort of vehicle for inspiration and motivation. I fucking love that, right? So that is a fucking wonderful idea. So the problem with that, so just kind of in terms of sort of our limitations, right, is that first of all, a lot of people are not going to be like The Rock, right? Like, let's just, that's 100%, right? That's literally, like, completely rare just for the simple fact that he's a movie star, he has a lot of time on his hands, right? And literally, he does this for a living. So, the downside of that is that if you have a bunch of people who are like him on Instagram, and then especially, let's say, with kind of teenagers or kids, if they're sort of constantly comparing themselves to these people, right, when their limitations are school, you know, if you're a teenager, potentially you're already working, right, sort of household stuff, you know, kind of family obligations, right, you're not going to be that. You're not waking up at 4.30 in the morning to go and work out like The Rock, right, because it's just impossible. And so the point is that if we're sort of bombarded with all of these images of, let's say, of beauty, of kind of intellect, of achievement, success, whatever, right? A lot of people are unfortunately going to feel down about themselves. And so the problem is, and just kind of tying it back to our sort of issue that we started with, right? Being at rock bottom before getting any sort of treatment. Right? <laughs> By the way, can I just say this for a second? The fact that you said rock bottom yeah. and we were just talking about the rock, that's fantastic. I'm sorry. Like a smackdown. Wow. Okay, just to give a, uh, our listeners just a little bit of background. I'm sure they it. know that. Well, The Rock, so when his, in his wrestling days, he yeah. had a move called The Rock Bottom. Yeah, it was so special. So the fact that we're talking about The Rock and right. Rock Bottom, okay, I'm sorry. It's ahead. okay. I'm sorry. So, so essentially when you think about it, right, so in terms of like hitting Rock Bottom, the other thing that we didn't focus on is for a lot of people, they feel like they can't be, or not that they can't be at that point, but for them it's sort of hard to envision themselves at that point. So, right, there's obviously the denial, the hopelessness, and then also for a lot of people because we're constantly comparing ourselves to everybody sort of in our environment, right, in our kind of broad culture. The thing is that for a lot of people, they don't want to acknowledge themselves as actually having a problem. So when Instagram and Twitter and whatever else, right, are so sort of well curated, all of these different profiles, the fact that we have to admit that there's this serious problem that we need, let's say, maybe long-term treatment for, really kind of devalues ourselves or devalues us in our own minds so from that aspect right so from the one aspect we have it is inspiration which I definitely love and I wish that there were more of that and then from the other aspect right you have this idea of well you know what like everybody seems so fucking perfect right I don't want to get treatment because therefore something's wrong with me and if you tie that into me viewing myself as a depressed piece of shit or me viewing myself as a coward because I have an anxiety disorder it's even more or I'm sorry it's even less likely that that person is going to get treatment so they're just in complete denial that there's anything wrong right where they're sort of constantly comparing themselves to these people on instagram and again right and the reason why i don't think the 
sort of like let's say waking up before 30 in the morning to go work out is a good thing and of course this is not sort of supposed to be a blanketed statement for everyone for like let's say the average person who has a nine to five job it isn't a good thing because first of all you need sleep right that's a hundred percent and there's no way that you're gonna go to bed at like eight o'clock and then wake up before go do all go to work and then obviously go do everything you need to do for your family and then have a social life on top of that it's just not gonna work out it doesn't st- I bet you there's somebody who's tried it. Yeah. Um, it's probably not a good idea, just from um, the the metrics you just kind of put out there. Right. Um, where you're gonna find time to meet all of your needs? If let's say you you are working a nine to five, but um, is there still a way to wake up a little bit earlier to do some kind of physical? Is there? necessarily 4 30 right i have a client by the way they wake up at five o'clock to go to the gym and this person actually sleeps for like four hours a night it's not healthy that's man. not no it's yeah not and, they, a, and they can't because by the way they work 70 hours a week so not only does this person not have much of a social life but on top of that they're literally waking up at like five in the morning to go work out so and the reason why i bring this up is because literally a lot of times what happens is that this sort of idea where like whatever i guess it's a discipline or a, i don't know maybe a sub-discipline personal development right self-help a lot of times this sort of goes into cultish territory where rather than right rather than kind of accepting ourselves and being okay with ourselves as not waking up at 4 30 to go to the gym right as not having a six-pack as not sort of being like this sort of glamorous looking person on instagram right the idea is oh how can we get ourselves to that point right that's sort of the life goal and i would argue or at least i would sort of at least ask right why are those your values why isn't it that possible that you can have have another set of values and why would you hold on to this one when you know that these people have very different circumstances than you do the rock is not working a nine to five job right bless him he's a wonderful person and i definitely love him and i definitely follow him on instagram but the point is that if i had those expectations for myself i would literally feel like a piece of shit all the time well one thing that's definitely good and it's funny that the, i feel like i'm always saying this uh, in one or in a bunch of our podcasts it's like i feel like because we're discussing this we're kind of actually, you know, looking behind the curtain here a little bit, right? Because, like, yeah, you're right. If, if you're uh, looking at the rock and let's say you're coming from, uh, like, you're an inspired, uh, like, that kind of a mindset. But, of course, you understand what your current situation yes, is and how... Yes, that's the healthy way of looking at it. That would be the healthy way right. of looking at it. The other way, yes, you, you, you would be comparing yourself to him. You'd, you'd be like, okay, uh, there must be some way to reach this uh, level. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to do everything in my power to do it but it's but yeah for example for the gentleman who the client who um sacrificed a sleep for that it's no good actually if i could just say a quick aside there's a sleep scientist his name is matthew walker um if if you want to go look him up it's spelled just like how it sounds and if i'm not mistaken he says for the average person thinks uh around really between seven and nine hours of sleep mm-hmm. is is good for the average person uh i would say uh if you're somebody who's trying to you know sacrifice sleep in order to um accomplish something right. the only you know you'd also have to see how it, how you're affected by it so right. it's specific to each person but like for me what i've tried in my own personal experience after failing with sleeping only like five hours or six hours before realizing that's not good enough right um, I started to do seven. Mm-hmm. Seven is good enough. It's it's um, and then I'm still able to kind of you know squeeze out an extra hour for um, quote unquote productivity. I don't always accomplish the productivity, by the way. Yeah. But that's the idea. So uh, again, back to that idea of um, creating like systems. But uh, to speak on what we were just speaking on, um, yes. Uh, these these influencers, uh, these people that we um, have in our um, world all the time, I think that it's important to realize that if you look at it from um, from a like a from a healthy perspective, if you try to borrow some of the things they're doing mm-hmm. but kind of piece it into your own world to yes. make it make sense. Mm-hmm. Um, in the way that it best makes sense for you, that's probably the best way to go about it. I know, I know that sounds a little general. No, I actually agree with that. No, yeah. I know, but like I, I had to f- say it that way because I'm trying to apply it to as many people yeah, as possible. Yeah, right. that's what I was thinking too. No, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so for instance, if uh, you see The Rock is working out every day at a certain time, maybe you don't have to do 4.30 in the morning every time, but maybe if if you're going to try to work out, you know, you try to do it all the time at a certain time. Let's yeah. say you're working 9 to 5, 
Maybe you decide to do the workout before work. Mm -hmm. I personally have issues with that. Mm -hmm. I like to do it after work. Okay. And I have a system for doing that after work all the time, for mm -hmm. me personally. And I do on the side of nine to five. Mm -hmm. you know? That may not be the case forever. For instance, if my circumstances change mm -hmm. as far as what my uh, uh, schedule is with work, right. uh, I might actually decide to one day take up trying to do it earlier in the morning, mm -hmm. or uh, maybe I'd work out longer. Right. Uh, there was a time, I've had periods of, uh, let's say, joblessness in the past. Mm -hmm. During that time, yeah, I would put way more time into working out, and um, that actually... You know, it's it's interesting. Um, that helped me, in a in a funny way, because the moment that I improved my health, it kind of in a roundabout way of looking at it improved my thinking, because mm -hmm. I was able to think a little, a little clearly, a mm -hmm. little more clear. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't have as many. Uh, Here's the thing. Uh, I'm not going to try to say that there's a direct um, because the, the direct correlation between working out and um, your thoughts mm -hmm. uh, in terms of like uh, ruminating thoughts versus like um, well, there is technically because no there's a correlation between working out and depression. Right. 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 So and I would they pretty much relate. I know. I'm just mm -hmm. I try to be careful. I don't want to say like working if you work out all the time that's, that's going to improve yeah, yeah. or well, how you feel. It, it will. It, not you most you're, likely yeah. it will. It's not black and white. So I don't, you're not saying that it's going to change it completely. Here, here's the thing. Why am I careful? Because there's uh, for example, there's people who may actually for example, uh, would you agree that uh, some people who are prescribed SSRIs? Mm -hmm are actually in need of them. Mm -hmm. Do you also agree that SSRIs are over-prescribed? What do you mean by that? Do you feel like, uh, not feel, sorry. Mm -hmm. Would you agree that there is a certain section of the population when being prescribed SSRIs mm -hmm. for their depression right. would benefit not necessarily, because here's the thing, there's some people I've seen before, so mm -hmm. this is an anecdotal now, right. so take that for what it is, mm -hmm. for, for what it is, but uh, I've seen people not be improved by SSRIs. Actually, they've uh, had, um, like, they wouldn't feel particularly about any anything. Like, they, they couldn't have, uh, they couldn't feel their emotions too much. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, it did eliminate um, that depressive side, but it didn't make anything... I mean, that's, exciting for them. Or, yeah, that's kind of the trade-off sometimes. But, yeah, but, mm -hmm. so... I guess you didn't. Uh, you asked me what do you mean instead of agreeing with it. So that's interesting. But mm -hmm. would you? St do you see where I'm coming from when I'm asking? Like, do you think that a lot of people are prescribed SSRIs, right. kind of like they're going to a pill mill or something like that, mm -hmm. as opposed to like maybe getting real? Uh, like, for instance, if do you think a do if a doctor said, hey, maybe you should have a like try eating healthy or something like mm -hmm. that, right? That might affect the way you're thinking or if you try to work out it might improve your thinking here's the issue it, with that. it's a so law that, that it would have uh, sorry could I just sure. over? one thing that I'm I noticed mm -hmm. is that the doctors there's laws around if someone is uh, depressed mm -hmm. and you actually prescribe them a pill mm -hmm. you, you you as far as the law is concerned you did what you're supposed to do as a licensed either uh, physician or psychiatrist or whatever to do your job. Right. If you tried something a little bit um, uh, counter to the things that there's laws around, like for instance being like, hey, you should have some uh, turmeric and some uh, health juice or whatever. Mm -hmm. And like, hey, maybe uh, maybe you're really like inflamed from all the, like the shitty processed food that you're eating all the time. Mm -hmm. No, no, I understand, mm -hmm. I agree. I, and I agree, yeah, you should <laughs> have reservations all the time. Okay. But let's say this, but what if like, do you have all these like, Factors that could possibly be, uh, and I, again, I said possibly. Right. Be, let's say they're physical, and then a lot of the physical ones are causing a lot of these rationalizations. Mm -hmm. uh, because, um, for instance, if if you're feeling like shit, let's say you're um, something hurts in your body or whatever. I mean, to rationalize why you might be feeling it, right. uh, you'll come up with reasons for it. Now, right. that and that's a normal person, so they might uh, well, then it might lead them to depressive thoughts and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But if their health was okay, uh, and I, again, I realize I'm only concentrating on health here, not any real, like, I don't know what's going on in the person's life. There could be other things. That's right. why I'm jumping around here. Sorry. But uh, why do you think, like, uh, no, let's do this. 
I'm noticing that like a lot of doctors won't say uh, to patients like this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they are just prescribing pills mm -hmm. and um, sometimes it's helpful. For instance, a psychiatrist prescribing an SSRI to a patient, mm -hmm. maybe, yes, maybe it'll numb somebody out and that's part of the process, mm -hmm. but maybe it'll numb them out enough to actually begin another form of treatment and right. try to do other kinds of behaviors mm -hmm. and that exists. Right. Uh, but then there's this other side of it that I was just talking about that's really um, strange territory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'll stop that thought there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So Because so, I was going on a rant. Right? Okay. So, okay. So in terms of depression, so yes, well, I mean, I do agree with you. The psychiatrists tend to overprescribe. So if somebody, well, in terms of what the research shows and in terms of kind of like... Um, but the recommendation is from, I'm not sure if it's the American Medical Association, the American Psychiatric Association, but the recommendation is essentially something along the lines of if a person has mild depression, then they don't go to medication. So medication isn't an option just for the simple fact that it actually, like you just said, doesn't really work. Or I, I think you said that, right? That for some people, oh no, you said for that it numbs, them, it numbs them out, right? So no, not that. But so it doesn't work. So the thing is like, why medication is actually supposed to be prescribed is it's technically not unless somebody has chronic depression it's not supposed to be a long-term solution so somebody's supposed to get medication in order for them to actually be able to guess what go to therapy right and this isn't actually something that's talked about so interestingly enough like bad psychiatrists what they'll do is like they won't refer you to a therapist so they'll just keep pumping you with medication not the best thing to do obviously and not right either so they're supposed to refer you to a therapist because the idea is in conjunction treatment is supposed to be twofold so what we see from research is that the best treatment is not either one or the other unless somebody has mild depression where medication is just really worthless. So if somebody has a moderate level of it or let's say a severe level of it, a severe is way harder to treat by the way, obviously. So, but if somebody has a severe or moderate level of it, it, what they would do is they would prescribe medications for you to be able to stand there and sort of withstand and kind of you know, participate in therapy. Because a lot of times what happens is when people aren't on medication, there's literally, they're just completely lethargic. So the problem is unfortunately, is that a person will come to treatment and they really won't have any motivation, right? They'll literally feel hopeless because that's what depression does. It just sort of sucks out any drive that you have. And so what would psychiatrists do sometimes is they would just say, oh, well, just take these and obviously you'll be okay. The problem, unfortunately, with antidepressants is, yes, one of those is a side effect. It obviously does sort of numb out, like, you know, the plethora of your emotions. Not for everybody, though, right? And for a lot of people, it doesn't. I'm not really sure what the stats are. But, and then also on top of that, what happens is that there are side effects to them, right? Which are kind of shitty sometimes. Not anything serious for the most part, right? But they're just like kind of unwanted, right? They're sort of a nuisance. And so the point is that in the long term, right? The hope is that essentially that the medication is essentially a foundation for therapy. That if therapy is doing its job right, then eventually the person is weaned off and kind of obviously you're off of medication. It's not supposed to be a long-term solution. Unless again, you have chronic depression, which is incredibly difficult to treat. And so here's, oh, going back. So here's the issue that I had with the health thing, right? So I agree with you and I don't agree with you. And this is a very nuanced topic, right? Which is obviously something, no, right? Which is something that we always talk about. So if you have mild depression and let's say your psychiatrist were to say like, Hey, you know, like you should try spending a little more time with your friends, like go work out, you know, go outside, spend more time, like off the screen, right? Kind of spend more time around people. You know, let's say, let's think about what kind of organizations can you join? Yes. So there I agree with you. So in that respect, that is absolutely the right thing to do. Cause guess what? Medication ain't going to do shit for you. Right. But if somebody has moderate to severe depression, none of that works. So you can tell them that. And what tends to happen is people feel really hurt by it because they're like, you're pretty much devaluing my illness. Right. So I'm going through this really serious thing. And what you the, the advice is pretty much just like, you know, just go and just do these things. And it's that simple. So it sort of depends on the severity of the depression. So for mild depression, yes, that actually is a good sort of, I don't know, not treatment, but it's a good, um, it alleviates their symptoms, right? So whoever, whoever's struggling with depression. So like obviously like all of these things in conjunction with one another, they make the person feel better if the depression is mild. But the more sort of severe it is, the less those actual like, let's say symptoms, or the less those, um, I don't want to call it band-aids because that's not, that's not a good term. Um, like a treatment? Yeah, it is a treatment. Like I guess the less those sort of milder forms of treatment. They're not are. likely to want to even try them. Like if somebody was yeah, that's the thing. So they they're not. But then on top of that, even if they do, they're actually not even likely to work for them. So as depression increases in severity, what happens is the treatment needs to sort of more so focus on the depth, right? What what I mean by depth is essentially their perceptions of themselves, their kind of environments, right? Their futures, their sort of sense of hope or hopelessness. But the point is, in more sort of mild treat or more mild cases of depression, right? Usually these things are good enough to work. Or you can just say, yeah, just try these different things, and the person will come back and say, hey, I feel better. 
Mm. Yeah. So here here's the thing, like especially with people like that, let's say who are moderately to severe to severely depressed. Um I don't think that's that's everybody. I think a lot of people have like a yeah. low level mm-hmm. kind of depression. Yeah. But uh, for them, I would just kind of pose this question, and I wonder if it's helpful. Mm -hmm. How much of your thinking throughout the day is, like, uh, trying to fulfill biological drives, uh, trying to just go along with social conditioning, Mm -hmm. and also um, feed these egoic drives? Mm -hmm. So, like, what do I mean by biological drives? Like, uh, I'm hungry, I'm horny, tired, sleepy, all that. Mm -hmm. social conditioning in terms of uh, like you're told what to do so you know you're being a good uh, I don't want to get too like messed up here but like you're being like a puppet in the system okay uh, I think a lot of social you're abiding by good. social norms yeah yeah you. but it's mm-hmm. like oh I'm just following orders right. so it's okay what I'm doing mm-hmm. you know and uh, that and I love that there's like so many times in history where like people were just following orders and it's like right. you know um, so it's a lot of this group think going along mm-hmm. and then these go drives like uh, where am I in relation to this other person mm-hmm. and, um, to make my world make sense I will put this person down or mm-hmm. push this person up and this is why I'm a victim right. or all kinds of ways of thinking about that mm-hmm. and what part of if I, again what the question I want to ask is uh, to everybody actually not just the moderate to severe it's like what part of you is real then mm-hmm. like what or what part of you is the proactive part mm-hmm. out of if you're run by all those drives wh- what part of you is actually actually you you know right. what I mean and like oh and by the way I love that you asked that question and I think that's actually one of the major reasons why people don't go to therapy is because they're terrified of the answer but then I have this thing I've been working on mm. actually and this is probably why I just brought this up mm-hmm. and I'm gonna hopefully be able to work on my way of uh, delivering this in the future mm-hmm. but this is where it's at now so I'll try mm-hmm. um, the reason why like for the longest time since probably 2011 12 something like that mm-hmm. Uh, I've been pushing that idea of like uh, like the ego mm-hmm. like w- why do I talk about the ego so much in, mm-hmm. in terms of that definition of ego as being like uh, um, this identification either with your thoughts or your beliefs or with a certain way of looking at things and kind of making it the same as who you are and when anything comes into conflict with it you react right. and all that like in that way of the ego why do I bring it up because I'm thinking like throughout history we've seen like a lot of, uh, a lot of tr- like the worst thing about humanity, tribalism, mm-hmm. right? It's like uh, uh, we'll always go into these groups, even if uh, everybody looks the same, we'll still find to find a way to divide. Like yeah. you have this kind of belief, I have this kind of belief. You're mm-hmm. into this religion, I'm into that religion. Right. Uh, this religion is correct. This is wrong. Right. Uh, I'm white. You're black. I'm this. I'm that. Whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like. What if, uh, the, the reason, again, why I talk about ego a lot is because what if we could, this is funny, and this would probably create a whole different set of issues, but I think it's interesting to think of it this way. What if we othered the ego? What mm-hmm. if we scapegoated the ego? Mm-hmm. What if, like, that became the mainstream thing mm-hmm. of, like, that's where the division is? Because we need, it's weird, it's like we have this, like, mm-hmm. thing that we need to fulfill mm-hmm. in this separation Thing that we like to do automatically mm-hmm. I was wondering if yeah if we could make the ego that that thing mm-hmm. and popular that popularize that mm-hmm. um, because I, I could see that by the way that creating a whole bunch of other issues like there might be people who are like oh I'm uh, I don't have a ego issue and then like uh, but you do and you need uh, to look at that and then it's like it's another form of ego or something right, right. like that oh. that could create things like that mm-hmm. probably yeah. but I wonder if that's like still like a level higher plus plus here's the thing if somebody othered the ego let's say because when let's say um, all your in the way I did it at least in my experience I was like all the bad decisions I was making that if I objectively thought about it I wouldn't want to do right. and then I would, it's like it's automatic all these different things that I decided to do even though until I trained you what I really wanted to do right. I would call that you know I would call that like 
ego or trying to maintain ego mm -hmm. and all of that. Mm -hmm. And then any times I was taking actions alt alter alternative to like uh, the stuff I was used to doing, mm -hmm. I'd be like, oh, okay, that's the proactive stuff. Mm -hmm. It could also you could if you really looked at it deeply, it could be another form of just a new ego or something like that. Yep. But that's a different discussion. Mm -hmm. But like uh, that, I wonder if that's helpful to anyone mm -hmm. to like to other like to other those bad behaviors or maybe there's even like some middle ground to it where you don't sort of view the ego or over identify with it as yourself or it's like this is this core of who i am right but then it's not the other case where you're sort of just looking at it as an like let's say constantly looking at it as an objective observer maybe the answer is somewhere in the middle yeah mm -hmm. fair enough yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah um see, that's why i play around with that idea still mm -hmm. because i know it's not a definitely not like a perfect idea at all no, maybe it's not even supposed to be. Because if you think about it, what idea really is, or what's a sort of conceptual system is. Even when we talk about therapy, right? It's either conceptual systems have major flaws in them, or they're just incomplete. So, either way. I mean, but it, it kind of makes sense, no? No, it definitely tried. does. No, yeah. I absolutely agree. And I think yeah. that there are cases where you should do that. So, which is why... I'm, at least from what little I've heard about it, right? I think that the middle ground is probably the best one. Because sometimes it's okay to identify with the ego, right? Like when the ego is telling you something that's accurate, right? You're supposed to accept it. Like here's this thing about my reality, right? And I'm supposed to now protect myself. But sometimes, right, when you, especially when you're super emotional and you feel like, let's say you're really angry, right? Or let's say even sometimes, even when you're really anxious, the idea is maybe it's sometimes best to ask yourself or to kind of view yourself as an observing ego, viewing the kind of ego and ask yourself, okay, like I'm really emotional right now let me take a step back and ask myself whether my reality is the reality but then if it is the reality then the idea is okay kind of back in ego mode of how do i now protect myself mm -hmm. right yeah it's a lot to unpack no it is it's, it's, it's a complex yeah it's definitely a complex but topic. definitely we got to an interesting point in the in the conversation mm -hmm. uh, i'm not sure if you want to like uh keep going maybe we could end it because we we're kind of like an hour in uh, do you have any like maybe do you want to do well, last I, thoughts or that like or? and that like went by so quickly holy shit um, I think we maybe. could, well, I mean, so in terms of, okay, so I think it's really important for us in terms of like mental health and mental illness to talk about, you know, well, I mean, we already technically did talk about, but to sort of like, um, I guess, emphasize how difficult it is for people to enter treatment. And that really what happens is like, let's say nine times out of 10, what happens is when people enter treatment that they find out it's actually not as scary as they thought it was going to be. So just like kind of going on a roller coaster ride, right? So the hardest part is actually doing it. And then when you get on it, you're like, whoa, it's not so bad. So the major barriers that I see for people going into treatment, or rather in this case, not going into treatment, are essentially number one is denialism, right? Which is obviously a defense that protects you. The second thing is a sense of hopelessness. And the third thing is the fear of finding out who you really are, right? Who, let's say is this person kind of deep down inside. Which is not really the fear because technically speaking, there is really no person deep down inside, right? It's sort of all you. So the idea is that we're sort of really afraid of figuring out or finding out what our parent patterns are. And so interestingly enough, that what sort of the main, and this is what I really wanted to focus on. So the major issue that let's say I have when people start out with treatment is sort of, the, and this is literally the major issue, obviously, even only through, well, throughout all of treatment is sort of their self-conception. So they have these sort of dichotomous sets of beliefs. So on the one hand, I would ask, okay, like, are you aware that you know that what you have is an actual medical condition that you have like a whatever a particular anxiety disorder a particular depressive disorder right and they'll say yeah yeah yeah, no i know i'm like okay so how come on the other hand right you give me these sort of or you tell me these concepts that are related to it right that don't really make sense and actually sound judgmental right don't make sense in the context of the medical disorder mm -hmm. so if let's say somebody has an anxiety disorder they would say well you know i don't want to be viewed as weak and i'm like but you're, that doesn't make sense. So on the one hand, you're saying this is an actual medical condition. On the one hand, or on the other hand, you're saying that this is an actual sort of human or moral failing, that I'm just supposed to be strong, that I have this sort of intense sense of fear, right, that I'm agreeing with is medically sort of prevalent, right, and is a condition. But then on the other hand, right, I'm supposed to just pick myself up and sort of be strong, whatever that means. And it's the same thing with depression, too. So people think I don't want to be weak, right? And with anxiety, it's also I don't want to be cowardly. And so the biggest sort of hurdle for people to go into treatment is acknowledge that they have what to I guess not even examine but in their minds because this is not the case but to acknowledge that they do perceive themselves as being cowardly weak as sort of being um, let's say maybe even non-masculine that's the other issue I deal with so a lot of times why let's say straight heterosexual men don't come into treatment is because they believe that they're weak right they're like you know tough guys are supposed to just sort of get through it right we're men men aren't supposed to talk about their feelings and so even if on the one hand they say like I understand that this is a medical condition 
there's that the intuition that's sort of ringing the bell and that's saying, hey, buddy, that's not really the case, right? It's not that you have an anxiety disorder. It's actually that you're kind of cowardly. Also, I would argue that if somebody thinks it's not manly to share your feelings, well, I would ask them, why did they think that? And then if they, let's say they said it feels really hard to want to talk about your emotions, then it's probably the manliest thing you could do, quote, unquote. Yes. Yeah, yes. because then you're actually trying to share by making the choice to try to engage with somebody and uh, figure out what's up with you yeah. is taking actions, probably arguably more of a quote unquote manly thing. Right. Also, and then also if it's a, um, uh, let's say we're talking about a female client or something like that, and we're not necessarily be concerned with masculinity or being a manly thing, whatever, right? Mm-hmm. It's a different conversation. Right. But um, yeah, it's, it's definitely the choice to, to treat yourself or rather to engage in treatment is it's one of the most bravest things that you could do it's it's a sign that it's like okay I get something is up Mm -hmm. and I want to try to fix it Mm -hmm. it's 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 there's strength in that it's not um, weak at all Mm -hmm. Uh, but I, I could see that you know somebody who's getting into the treatment for the first time or even been in it even just for a little bit yeah. I, I can see how yeah they would be thinking about it in that sort of way so yeah so the biggest challenge is literally the intuition helping the person reframe their intuitive thoughts because even if they don't accept them consciously right this and like we technically know this with studies right in terms of like implicit like sexist and racist attitudes Right, a lot of people have them and they're not aware of them because consciously speaking, they know that those are no longer their values or they've never been their values, but somewhere kind of underneath, right? I mean, there's a system of values that kind of percolates, right, from your culture. So unfortunately, what I, <laughs> you know, I'm using that word. <laughs> and so unfortunately, what happens with people is that even though like they hold on to these really sort of scientific beliefs, on the other hand, they're like, oh, but there's this other part of me that's telling me that I'm really weak and I don't want to acknowledge that. Hence why I don't want to go to treatment. And so what people nine times, again, nine times out of 10, right? What they find out is that what they really are, who they really are, is actually a pretty great person that there's nothing to be terrified of. And they're not like these sort of weak or cowardly or even sort of horrific people that they might perceive themselves to be but that's the biggest hurdle to get into treatment essentially so I could see how let's say somebody who uh, again back to the beginning of where we started here yeah. if somebody hits let's say rock bottom again if if your whole uh, the, that structure all your, all your beliefs has kind of gone down at this point you're ready to try to um, take some kind of uh, alternative actions to try to kind of get out of that place mm-hmm. then yeah treatment is probably the one of the best I mean no I mean arguably it's the best choice right mm-hmm. um, I mean I suppose uh, there's other uh, institutions available let's say we're talking in the context of somebody doing uh, somebody in drugs mm-hmm. or uh, with alcohol for alcohol there's AA mm-hmm. and if I'm not mistaken there's something called NA mm-hmm. narcotics right. anonymous right yeah. for um, but those aren't treatments by the way those aren't treatments yeah. support, but I suppose it's like a support yeah I hear you not that it's bad but it's it's good in conjunction with treatment no I was just trying to throw out like you know uh, it, let's say somebody's listening mm-hmm. who's coming from that perspective I'm just kind of trying to throw out like a map right. like you know like ropes because like maybe they, they don't think about it automatically right um, yeah like if you have a support group there's other people kind of going through the things that you're going through stat works mm-hmm. um, but yeah therapy is uh, huge great suggestion because the therapist is going to get you thinking about all kinds of um, ways to uh, not necessarily combat but to work with what it is that you have going on maybe right. try to be able to change and the thing is it's it's more personal that's the point and a lot of people they need sort of treatment tailored to their particular needs right where the yeah, person too general it's right and so technically speaking i actually i like self-help right so that's why i mean general. right that's the, so but it's not either or so it's not black and white so i'm, I'm not even I, I felt like you were thinking that that i was about to criticize self-help i'm actually not yeah so i'm not going to do that so like um you know obviously we have gordon marino on he wrote a self-help book the existential survival guide we're gonna have sky cleary on She's writing a self-help Actually, book. Actually, believe it or not, he said it wasn't like um, it wasn't so much of a self-help. It's not like he was. He, I think he said that. He, he said um, he wasn't trying to do the whole personal development thing when right. he was writing his book. I, that's not necessarily. At least that's what he said. No, no, no. I agree with you, but I don't think of it as personal development. I don't think the two are necessarily Sorry, connected. Se- yes. Yeah. 
Self-help can just be help. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to, like, grow. It could just mean that you want to, like, alleviate particular symptoms. Fair enough. Yeah. I, I just felt like from that interview, he yeah. tried to uh, distinguish himself from that. Yeah, I mean, it could be. Just to be fair. No, I hear you, but not, I mean, technically speaking... But it is, like, help. Well, yeah, and and in, even in the category of the book, I mean, it's listed under self-help. Yeah. So, interesting. And okay. How to live in authentic Yeah, right, right, right. Right, right, right. right. So, I mean, yeah. Okay. So, and I, but then again, going back to the topic of self-help, I don't in itself think that it's a bad thing. I think it's a really, really good thing. And I think that in conjunction, right, because the thing is, even with therapy, technically speaking, oh, by the way, so like, I think this is not something that's kind of really talked about. So, but therapy itself is also self-help. So, like, the things that we teach our clients, right, the t- particular tools and skills, all self-help stuff. So, like, the cognitive thought record, mm-hmm. self-help, the dysfunctional stuff thinking sheet self-help mindfulness meditation self-help deep breathing self all of this is self-help so the point is that these are even things that you could learn on your own you don't necessarily need a therapist for right the problem is that when we kind of increase in severity in terms of mental illness what happens is people really need a therapist because they don't trust their own beliefs and their own thoughts mm. right or n- let me not say that no no it's that their thoughts and so and their beliefs are so sort of in not inherently, but they're so kind of toxic that they're very hard to change when the person is examining them on their own. Mm-hmm. So it's like if a person just, let's say, discovers how to use the thought record, right, without, let's say, a therapist. And they're like, oh, okay, let me just like try it. Let me see if like this can help me feel better. Nine times out of ten, if the person is either moderately or severely depressed, they're not going to feel better. They're going to find themselves back in the same loop where they were before. So it's like this is the first thought. Like, let's say I'm worthless. I'm a piece of shit. They're going to filter out all of the positive information. They're going to notice all of the negatives. And they're going to say, oh, see, I knew I was right. So technically speaking, all the therapist really does is they sort of help the person see themselves in a much more realistic way. So when you have mild depression right you can technically use self-help by the way which is why i'm definitely not against it so if somebody has a mild depression technically speaking if it's mild yeah that's if it's the word right, right. if it's mild right 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 yeah. so even mild depression is still depression by the way yeah. so if it's mild what we would do is we would actually not even recommend therapy by the way so i said this before it's like about medication that medication is virtually useless technically speaking so is kind of therapy so what is actually helpful is for them to kind of learn these skills on their own right so when you get kind of up in the in the sort of severity level of depression or anxiety it's just it's much harder for you to do it on your own because your sort of judgment and your reason is so cloudy but when somebody has mild depression technically speaking it's not even that great of an idea to accept them as a client like to see them for a session or two to give them these skills like wonderful right but to see them like for more than that i would say it's pretty unethical because once they get the hang of it bam they got it it's like they would they don't need me or anyone else but so oh so but the point of self-help is right that i think in itself it's a really really wonderful thing it's just that why i think it works so well in conjunction with therapy is because that with therapy people really need that sort of personal touch where they need the person to actually sort of see them for who they are and to not only accept them for who they are but then to sort of help them to work toward becoming whoever it is that they want to be because unfortunately in terms of illness right the sort of more severe it is the harder it is for that person to do that on their own but self-help in itself is a wonderful thing and i've also found by the way that people who started off with self-help that kind of brought them or was the catapult for them to go to therapy so oh wow yeah Mm -hmm. wow yeah um well i guess then all right so yeah if somebody uh so we talked about what someone in a rock bottom sort of a situation could do Mm -hmm. talking about what somebody with a mild sort of depression could do um that's for people who are just depressed let's say somebody is not even depressed Mm -hmm. and they want to um take like you know, actions was really hard for them to do it because, again, a lot of the things that would, um, you know, leverage that motivational seesaw in a direction where they would take action is, you know, you need, sometimes you need a lot of pain in mm-hmm. order to do that. Mm-hmm. But do you think necessarily someone who is actually generally okay, like health wise, like mentally, mm-hmm. do you think that there's ways for them to also um, explore um, changing mm-hmm. that's how to put it like that's still possible for them because it's it's not easy because again to unwire certain beliefs or to try new actions right, right. is never easy yeah so. so i mean a person doesn't have to necessarily meet the criteria for a particular diagnosis or an illness in order to benefit from therapy absolutely not i mean the thing is that mm, Technically speaking, in that respect, they could benefit just as well from self-help. I uh, The thing is with the therapist, right? So with self-help, obviously, a lot of people don't have the time to sort of go through the literature. So what the therapist does is they, he or she takes the literature and they sort of condense it for them and kind of help them take those steps. So that's when I would say it's helpful. But in that respect, if a person isn't really sort of depressed or kind of severely anxious or even moderately anxious, a lot of times if they want to, they can like choose self-help instead. But I think that... Like, Condenses. Yeah. 
it, so, so it takes out yeah. the important parts. No, so yeah. then that's interesting. So then um, that takes us back to, I guess, stuff like podcasts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, not just ours, of course, but <laughs> I just know it the, looks like ours a marketing is the best. thing. Right? <laughs> okay. But like... <laughs> Uh, that makes sense, right? Yeah, I suppose like or just videos in general on YouTube. Mm -hmm. because it could be a TED talk, right? Right. So th they would also be condensing. So okay. So I guess for somebody in that um, position, if they wanted to, let's say they don't have a lot of time, they could be watching videos on certain subject matters that are kind of for them, like tailored to them. Right. Um. I I don't know. Would you recommend any books? I have a book I, I could recommend. That's. Uh, you mean like good. self help stuff? Yeah, actually, I do. Yeah, I have a psychologist uh, actually who wrote it. It's a self help book though. Um, it's called. It's by Carol Dweck. Mm -hmm. Where she, I'm not gonna give a background on her. I don't want to get it wrong. I'll say this though. She wrote a book called uh, Mindset, mm -hmm. and it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, she talked also about System One thinking, System oh, Two cool. thinking in there. Mm -hmm. um, she, yeah, which is all self help and it's all psychology too. Yeah, mm -hmm. and no, and yeah, she she's like, hey, I'm gonna use legit studied material from academia right and then still related in kind of like a self-help way this way it's accurate mm -hmm. applicable and also worded in a way that's still um palatable yeah um i, I found like she's a good like uh, middle ground one i could suggest there's other ones i could suggest too just depends on um the person mm -hmm. For instance, like there were times in my life I read, let's say, the book Power of Now. That was good. Mm -hmm. Now, did I take everything from the book as gospel? Not necessarily. But did I like the way the author worded things in that book and the and I resonated with it and I was able to make a change and kind of get more, a little more uh, present to the moment and all that and kind of clear up my thinking? Mm -hmm. Yes. But um, again, there's there are other authors who may have written a book in that sort of style, mm -hmm. who are not necessarily coming from that um, quote unquote new agey sort of a perspective, mm -hmm. right. and you don't need that. That's why probably maybe the first book I suggested was like mindset. Okay. Uh, but then there's also flow. Yeah. A book called Flow, and yeah, uh, there's more, but I can't think of it. At the well, a really good one. It's called. Um the shrink and the sage so i don't remember who the second author was i don't remember so it's written by two people so it's actually self-help but it's written by a philosopher and a, psych a psychotherapist so i forgot her name the psychotherapist of the book but julian bagani is essentially the philosopher of the book so what they do is they answer these sort of deep profound kind of not necessarily only existential questions but also mental health questions and just kind of like everyday questions from the various perspectives so julian bagani gives you answers from a philosophical perspective from like the philosopher how would a philosopher for answer this question what is a good life to him what is happiness to him right what is sort of personal growth what is meaning to him right wow. and then from her perspective it's what are all of these things from a psychotherapist's mind right or to wow. a psychotherapist yeah so it was really good so it's like for every question they both answer it and they both have actually pretty different answers which is so cool and you could kind of sort of i guess use your judgment to figure out which one works best for you now, do you think there's anything wrong? Let's say somebody is reading uh, like a new agey book. Mm -hmm. and, uh, in the interest of time, I won't go too deep into it. Okay. But like, for instance, there was a book I read when I was uh, once upon a time, like pretty, yeah, I would diagnose myself as depressed. Maybe if someone else would have been like, no, just mild or no, you're not. You could have really been. Or it could have been. Yeah, yeah. Whatever. But, mm -hmm. yeah. but there was this book I read by Rhonda Byrne, Rhonda Byrne. The name sounds familiar. What was now, it? Now, she originally wrote the book, The Secret. That's where I got it from. So, okay. it wasn't The Secret, though, that mm -hmm. I read. There was this book called uh, The Magic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Get out. Yeah. Now, <laughs> I understand. I Especially the kind of stuff that we talk about right. and the kind of stuff that I espouse as well. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting book to bring up right now. Yeah. But... Um, Yes, so this book was a book of a whole bunch of gratitude practices, mm -hmm. right? And um, I was in such a place where I could, you could say, quote unquote, quote unquote. I love saying quote unquote. <laughs> what are you where, quoting? <laughs> I was, uh, I, I felt depressed, so at the time it felt like I had reached my version of a rock bottom. Mm -hmm. So I was willing to try anything. Right. That's why, for instance, when I saw like uh, that kind of a book, mm -hmm. even though it was very um, certain kind of languages, there's very flowery mm -hmm. and use a lot of um, new agey concepts. But which, by the way, I don't disregard. I just think that there's um, 
it's it's an interesting area to explore and I'd have to get into the nuance of like what I take um, mm-hmm. uh, seriously and then what I take as like I'm not sure what to think about that particular statement right. I'll unpack that later mm-hmm. but um, yeah I tried these practices out and it worked mm-hmm. and it was great and I, I applied the stuff that I learned in the book and uh, despite it being very uh very kind of like fantastical in some ways because um, they're like you know they talk about ideas like you'll attract certain circumstances to you by the nature of your thoughts I actually agree with that it, I don't know how she meant it but it, I agree the with thing. that yeah. right it's, that's that's what I meant by the nuance mm-hmm. right? I agree with it too right. if you have a certain belief that things are going to be good or okay you're going to look for evidence of it and of course a lot of the actions that you're ta- you'll take yeah. are going to be in that direction right and if you feel hopeless I mean technically you're going to create an environment that mirrors it back to you yeah absolutely I just wonder how she meant it right yeah. and also like the law of attraction as well like for instance uh, if you think certain thoughts like like will attract like and so if you think about um, attracting positive circumstances in your life or attracting a specific thing or a job or all that and mm-hmm. your thoughts are around that you will quote unquote manifest it right. and that's the language they use and um, see when I see stuff like that I like to make it make sense mm-hmm. still in in my world but not necessarily take it word for word exactly what they're right. saying mm-hmm. so for instance a word like manifest will pop up the idea of like it's just magically appearing mm-hmm. and you'll be thinking about these things and you'll magically have this stuff come to you mm-hmm. um, that part I'm not so sure about I'll put it that way to be politic, you know nice about it right mm-hmm. but um, but if you do think about a thing long enough again you like I said before you look for evidence of it right and so it, it does stand to reason that you would take actions and and move in a direction uh, of the way that you're thinking. Mm-hmm. So in that sense, is that kind of idea valid? Mm-hmm. But back to the main reason why I brought it up, that's a very new age thing, but was it helpful to me? Mm-hmm. Did I find a way to uh, apply it in my own life and um, feel better after 30 days of like a mm-hmm. gratitude practice? Yeah. yeah. And but then is there probably another book that depending on who's watching this could resonate with that has very similar kinds of ideas or right. practices in there? Mm-hmm. Of course. Yeah. So that's why like um, you know if somebody recommends something new agey, if you do go for that kind of stuff, try to just go for what's practical and applies to you. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, there's other sources of information that are more academic too. If that's what you're kind of looking for, yeah. that talks about these ideas. Why do I like the new agey thing sometimes? Mm-hmm. Because it's kind of like poetry mm-hmm. in the sense that it feels like there's a very creative way to talk about the way you feel mm-hmm. and what's going on yeah. that kind of gets your imagination kind of playing around with it. Mm-hmm. And it might just be more digestible to try to change things from I mean, that perspective. Yeah, and I mean, technically speaking, I mean, we're always on the search for something magical. That in itself, is, like, in itself is not a bad thing. Like, most of us hate sort of the mundane or the ordinary, so, yeah. Right, so for instance, if somebody picked up an, uh, like some kind of book from academia, it could essentially be saying the same thing that could be one of those New Age books. That's true. But maybe just the New Age book made it sound interesting, therefore the application of the information in there was yes, more Yes, I, I gotta give it to them, though. The New Age writers, they're not as dry as academics are. That's, mm-hmm. that's, that's the thing. Yeah. That, that's, but, you, but you do need to, like, uh, if somebody's checking that stuff out uh, it's best to use your common sense to the best of your ability to see what's what is applicable from there and uh, what you can kind of get out of there for for you right i'll put it that way yeah, yeah. you know what's the most interesting part of this entire talk i don't know if you noticed this but like do we see do you see like how we flow with the information like we kind of counter each other's points but then we find a way to synthesize them yeah that's literally like i think that's the point of dialogue to be able to sort of take two perspectives Cause usually it's never one extreme or another to kind of take two perspectives and find a sort of middle ground to them I mean, uh, yeah, uh, for one, for instance, like, uh, we are having a back and forth here, which is really cool. It's, there's no lulls in the conversation. We, um, we definitely have stuff to contribute as far as that goes. And I mean, if I had to say, uh, I, I, I would, I don't think for instance, like I just brought up a whole bunch of like new agey stuff. I would say from what I know of you, like you don't necessarily like that kind of mm-hmm. subject matter. No, definitely not. But, but 
I can still but take through, something away from it. Right. Yeah. And through conversation. Yeah. Plus, when you get into the nuance of things, if someone's willing to listen to the nuance and actually be there with you and like break it down with you, right. then everyone understands each other. And like William Irwin said in one of our earlier podcasts, yeah. to understand all is to forgive yes, all. Yes, yes, yes. And then St. Francis of Assisi. Mm-hmm. Uh, Wow. That, wow. <laughs> no, that worked no, no, out. No, no, no. Uh, seek to understand, then to be understood. Yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Right. But that's interesting. I had a brain fart. So, but I recover. That's good. <laughs> but what's so cool is that essentially we kind of we can pick out things in each other's sort of dialogue that we can take away and say, oh, yeah, no, I actually agree with that. And that is true. And I think you can technically do that with almost anybody, even like with somebody who is actively like religious. Because I've actually found that there are religious people who I like really agree with on a lot of things, especially when it comes to ethics and morality. So, um, and this is like a huge side note. So one of the people like academics who I really love, his name is Chris Chris Hedges. Like he's a devout Christian. Mm -hmm. And so I don't really fucking care because he's like super left wing. He's a socialist, right? And so that we can vibe on those ideas. And like technically speaking, his ideas are actually informed by his Christian beliefs. So it's so interesting that it's really nine times out of ten again obviously not always because some people are like super duper extreme but there's usually something that you can take away from another's person's let's say dialogue or information mm. yeah yeah plus uh, I'm uh, with in terms of like what other people believe as far as their religious beliefs and stuff I'm more concerned with like uh, uh, with their actions mm-hmm. and how they uh, treat people and even on the level of beliefs I've actually found a lot of um, points of similarity for instance like say i uh don't necessarily like i'm not a christian or anything like that but have i heard things that uh let's say uh like a biblical figure like jesus said or something Mm -hmm. like that and i was like sounds good yeah and interesting yet i I don't know if you knew this but leo tolstoy actually wrote his own bible and so not really wrote it but what he did was I had no clue about that yeah, so, and it's so cool so like what he did he literally took out the teachings of Jesus took out all of the mystical garbage and said this is what we should focus on and that's like one of the best books I've ever read it's actually really really fucking good Damn. yeah it's called The Gospel in Brief obviously Fair right enough. I guess but then I was like what he took out all the mystical stuff that yeah. was the good stuff <laughs> <laughs> the fun stuff yeah but no because he said the teachings of Jesus are super important so he said like if you view it in themselves oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. so what he did was he literally just took out Jesus's teachings he took out the rest of the garbage and he said this is what we should read and like when you read them in themselves you're like oh wow no I agree with all of this stuff this is actually really good right so when you're not like kind of you know um, let's say bombarded with ideas of God and the Holy Spirit and you know whatever like whatever you know, with certain stories yeah right? and the laws and whatever else right essentially the teachings of Jesus they're like they make a lot of sense like they're like shit that hippies would agree with and you're like yeah wow holy shit hippies and hipsters <laughs> alright wow <laughs> <laughs> All right. we have done it we have come to the yes. end of the round um, do you let's let's ask the audience a question I suppose mm. um, what, what do you think is uh, if you're trying to change something what do you think is keeping you from trying to um to take actions in the direction of changing if uh if you are currently uh working on yourself or something like that we'd love to hear uh, like a story from you if you're willing to share um see what you're you know how you're doing in your personal journey i don't mind um don't mind i don't want to put it that way but if if for instance like we see a comment or something pop up and uh, we feel like we could give any kind of feedback or anything like that um Leon's qualified to do that, uh, but not um, well. Whatever. Long story short, we'd be happy to well, yeah, comment to and mm-hmm. yeah, and have a back and forth with our listeners. Yeah. Um, what about you? Know, well, the only thing, just kind of a few plugs, right? The, the usual stuff that we do. So you guys can check us out at overall well overall network dot com, and then you can check us out at overall um, wait, yeah. So overall online at Instagram and overall online on Twitter. And then obviously follow our guy Vegas. So Vegas Media Designs at Instagram. So he pretty much, he takes care of all of our media stuff. He's like really phenomenal. And for the other dude at overall, follow our guy Andy overall, who has like phenomenal articles and sort of really inspiring pieces on Tupac's life. And um, so like artwork related to Pac and his music and just different people who were inspired by him. And he did an interview with Angie Thomas. So check that out. That was really cool. And, and again, yeah, yeah, if you guys uh, uh, 
uh, like what you're hearing, again, click the subscribe button, click on the little bell, yep. follow us at Seize the Moment Podcast on Twitter, oh, sorry, on Facebook and Instagram, yep. and then Seize underscore, underscore. podcast <laughs> on Twitter. Yeah. There's reasons for that, but a little unpack that. <laughs> We're not point. even fully sure what they are. Yeah. And also look forward to in the future, uh, we were actually already just got approved, so good news. Uh, we're now affiliated with uh, Google Play, so you will be seeing an audio form of the podcast available on Google Play Podcasts. Uh, we're still working it out. We just found out about it today, so we're going to make it look good and make it work out, and we'll uh, plug that at a later point. And working on getting on iTunes, iHeartRadio, and Stitcher as well, so look forward to that in the future. Thanks for watching. Thanks, guys. See ya.